Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk, coming to you from Nassau Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So hi there, guess what? My name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening. Oh my, on these difficult times, but thank God. The station is working hard to make sure we have great programming, and I'm very honored and humbled that I'm able to come to you each and every week during these rather unprecedented times. So today I'm going to talk more about the holiday of Shavuos, which is coming up in about two weeks. It's a two-day holiday celebrated from the sunset of May 28th until the nightfall of May 30th. Now, what's the holiday of Shavuos all about? This coincides with the date that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai more than 3,300 years ago. It comes after 49 days of eager counting as we prepared ourselves for this special day, starting from the holiday of Passover and concluding on this holiday of Shavuos. How is it celebrated? By lighting candles, staying up all night to learn Torah, and in better times, if you were able to, we go to the synagogue and hear the reading of the Ten Commandments. And of course, most importantly, we feast on dairy foods and much more. What I'm going to share with you today is some aspects of this event that will give us tips on the model of life, of how we look at many things looking back at this holiday of Shavuos. So if I was to um, give this a, a title, if you have something to say, important to say, we can actually learn from how the Torah was given at Mount Sinai. Kind of conversational tips that we can learn from that event. So even if what I'm about to say may not coincide with Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments, and you don't, uh, or you find some disagreement and contradiction between what I'm about to say and what Charlton Heston has to say, my suggestion is to call him up and ask him for a refund, because not everything that you saw in the Ten Commandments exactly is the way it was. That was made based on Hollywood. And what I'm about to share with you is based in the Torah itself. And on a lighter way, a lighter note, what I'm trying to say is that the way the Torah was given at Mount Sinai can actually teach us in how, if you have something important to say, how do you get it across? So the first thing is, what's the difference between Speaking and nagging. Well, speech involves one individual speaking words and ideas. Another individual hearing those words and ideas. So you're speaking. Nagging, what is nagging? Is defined as one person articulates words and thoughts. Another person hearing, at best, grating static. Oh, here he goes again. You know, that kind of thing. So, we usually only have one chance to communicate an important message. Now, if we botch up that opportunity, the odds of the recipient getting the message in a second go-around are greatly, you know, uh, minimized. Therefore, before we're about to say something, in order to make it last, substantial thought and planning has to precede any conversation of significance. So surely the Creator assured that the words would enter one ear and then stay put. That's exactly what happened in the holiday of Shavuos. God spoke to us. In our nation's 3300 year history, God has directly addressed us exactly once. Once when God descended upon Mount Sinai, gave his Ten Commandments to everybody assembled. So there was this one communique that was intended to last more than 3,000 years. So without a doubt, the creator of speech utilized this opportunity to its maximum and therefore assured that the words he would utter then would enter in one ear and then stay put. In fact, the Medrash says that the mighty voice that, that, that spoke the Ten Commandments had no echo. 
An echo occurs when sound waves encounter resistance, striking an impregnable obstruction. Like you throw a ball, it hits the wall, it bounces back. God's words had no echo because it penetrated. It pierced the desert mountains, the human minds and the hearts. Nothing and no one blocked that voice out. Therefore, in doing it that way, God also left us a perfect, you could say, prototype for us to follow on those occasions when we really want our words to be taken seriously. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, whatever. If we want our words to stay and stick and be you know, heard, we have to learn from how God made a message at Mount Sinai and is still alive and well 3,300 plus years. So here's some conversation lessons that I learned from the great communicator, from God himself. Don't, when we talk, don't be by the way it. If you have something important to say, don't. Uh, remember, when God spoke to us at Mount Sinai, it wasn't like a sudden, unexpected event. It wasn't, oh good, you're here, hi, how you doing? There's something I want to discuss. Or, what did you uh, just do? We've got to talk right now. That's not the way it's going to happen. Guess what? Look carefully. We read three days in advance. God relayed to the Israelites that he has an important message. And when the time arrived, everybody was prepared. Everybody was curious and everybody was eager. So the momentous of the occasion sunk in. They were receptive because there was a preparation. So that's number one. You know, prepare everybody, let them know, like they announce uh, there's going to be a press conference, you know, at a certain time. You're prepared and you watch it carefully and take it very seriously. Another thing, choose your timing. The Torah tells us when God communicated, it was on the third day in the, in the it was morning, it was becoming morning. Now, considering that the Sinai event had a spectacular light and sound show, Torah says, and all the people could see the sound on the flames. We could ask ourselves, wouldn't it be more impressive and awe inspiring that the end had been scheduled for after dark? Why didn't God speak to us at nightfall with all the flashing in the skies? Torah emphasized on the third day when it became morning. Apparently, God didn't want to address a weary nation. He chose a, ma a moment when our minds are clear and are most alert during the daytime, as opposed to, you know, announcing important messages when everybody is falling asleep. Another important thing is choose your setting. If you want something heard and received, make sure your setting is right. So contrary to popular conception, God is not in the habit of making miracles simply to impress everybody. And what do we read in the Medrash? So when God gave the Torah, a bird did not chirp or take wing. The bird stopped flying around. An ox didn't, you know, make any noise. The angels didn't fly. It was all quiet. The sea didn't move. So what the Talmud is telling us, God doesn't make miracles simply to impress us. Every miracle has a purpose. So why was it that God hushed all over the voices aside for his own? Why, why not? Would his voice have been drowned out by all this common background noise? Or is the elimination of even a minor distraction vital, important to creating an atmosphere when the listener is now completely tuned in and receptive? So in order to create that atmosphere, everything was quiet. It wasn't as if God had to make scream louder than the, than the oxes and louder than the angels, etc., etc. Create the right atmosphere. Fascinating insights of how we can learn from the way God communicated to us at Mount Sinai of how we must communicate our own messages. Another important part is that use both sides of your mouth. Oh, what are you talking about? Rabbi, Rabbi, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? How can you talk that way? Well, let me tell you. The Medrash tells us that God's voice serenaded the Israelites was heard from all four directions, as well as from above and below. So before 
you deliver your message, ask yourself, am I broadcasting this message from all directions? Or is there some part of me that is signaling a different message altogether? How many times we look at a teacher or a leader, he says one thing, but he's, he's talking from both sides of his mouth. For him, he says something this, and some, for someone else, something else. When God spoke to us at Mount Sinai, it was all embracing from both sides. It was one complete, cohesive message. So when you want to convince and you want to attempt to bring over a message, if you have not internalized the message yourself, and it's not coming from your heart completely, there's little chance that you will find another person receptive as well. Another important dimension and tip, you could say, from how God communicated, how we can learn to communicate, is don't mince your words. The whole grandiose event centered around Ten Commandments. Do you know how many letters there were? 620 letters in those Ten Commandments. And it left room for the addressees, those who are listening, to be able to ponder the words and consider its multiple meanings and lessons. Guess what? It gave room for thought instead of stifling it. Got us to think, and we haven't stopped thinking and analyzing ever since. Because God made us, prepared us, presented us, so that everything was received in a most receptive way. And this is what we are learning today about the holiday of Shavuos. Another aspect that we can learn, and this is a deeper side, and I kindly ask, focus on this, my friends, that the whole event at Mount Sinai of the Jewish people standing around the mountain and God speaking is always spoken about metaphorically like a marriage. The meetings of a bride and the bridegroom. And I'm going to share with you now that in a, any marriage, in any relationship, the true definition of a relationship is when one leaves oneself aside and does or lives and acts in a way to make the other person to appreciate what the other person is all about. I often tell this joke about a boy and a girl go out on a, on a, uh, like a meeting, a date, and the man is talking about himself, how great he is, how you don't realize what a great man I am, and this and that, he's going on and on and on and on. For half an hour, 30 minutes, he's talking about himself. And after that, he turns to the young lady, he says, you know, I've been talking about myself so long. Please, t please, it's your turn. Tell, now, please, tell me how, what you think of me. It's all about himself. We're gonna, I'm going to share with you now that in our way of thinking, the whole story of the whole event, the celebration of Shavuos, is part of an ongoing perfect quarrel that we have with God. And it has a deep message to all of us. I'm here to share with you that all three holidays, three major holidays of the Jewish calendar, is one big fight. Long before John Gray wrote his best-selling book, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, prior even to those planets' creation, a different kind of book of relationships was written. You know what I'm talking about. It was released in the year 2000 BC before creation and it has to date sold over 6 billion copies, topping the charts as the best seller of all times. This non-fiction work chronicles the very first romance ever. One which took, takes place between the author and his beloved bride. You and me, all of us. What we're talking about, this great romance, is the wedding day that was set for the sixth day of Sivan. The sixth day of Sivan, again, I remind you, is the first day of Shavuos that we are about to celebrate at the end of this month, the month of, of May. 
Where was this marriage? Where did it take place? In Mount Sinai. As I mentioned earlier on, the menu was dairy. Who was on the invitation list? All of the cosmos. And this relationship at Mount Sinai was a historic day. It was a marriage. It's a marriage, my friends, that has lasted 3,000 years and counting. Now, there are many hiccups on the way, as any good marriage would have. And as much was necessary to ensure its survival. Now, the couple, what I'm going to share with you is, could never come to a consensus regarding the naming and the significance of the special, noteworthy milestones in their relationship. It is through the lens of this union that all the future ones can be seen. Just like we can learn from how to communicate from God as he did it at Mount Sinai, we can learn in our own relationships of this unique relationship or expressions in this quarrel that exists between ourselves and God. And how this is the basis of the greatest love that ever exists. You see, over the millennium, scholars have examined this relationship from every angle. And it, it provides us with countless relationship tips. To understand the dynamics of this cosmic relationship can actually help benefit every one of our marriages. You see, as you know back, we all know our history. Through this relationship, from its very inception, there were many quarrels between the spouses, just as is common today in many amongst couples, where we find ourselves continuously, constantly arguing the same argument. In this instance, the couple can never come to a consensus regarding the names and the significance and noteworthy dates, dates and milestones in their relationship. So I'm going to chronicle to you now the history of the disagreement that we have with God. Let's remember, the relationship took root during the bride's difficult sojourn in the land of Egypt. We all started out coming out of Egypt. Along came this knight in shining armor, the groom, rode into the bride's life and saved her from this tyrannical ruler. God took us out of Egypt. Since then, we celebrate what happened on the first date, on the 15th day of Nisan. This was the day when this relationship began. A holiday each year when we celebrate Passover, we relive the experiences of that love at first sight. When God came, God is the, in the figuratively, metaphorically speaking, like the groom, and now bringing out his bride. Now, as far as the name of this holiday, we don't see eye to eye <laughs> with the groom. We all know there are many disagreements that happen amongst young couples. But here I'm sharing with you a significance in a disagreement in the naming of the holiday of Passover that reflects something bigger in our relationships as well. Because in the Torah, the groom, the Torah describes this holiday as Chag Hamatzos, the holiday of Passover, excuse me, the holiday of Matzahs. What do you, what do you and me call this holiday? Pesach, Passover. Now look at the interesting difference here. The name holiday of Matzah reflects the unswerving loyalty of the bride to her groom. Matzah is the product of the dough that had no time to rise. It was all made in hurriedness out of Egypt. It speaks of the bride's readiness to travel into the wilderness. You know, they didn't leave Egypt and go into, into some beautiful, you know, gated community. They were running into the wilderness, far away from civilized life and the comforts and stability. Not even knowing where they're going. So only somebody deeply in love would follow her loved one in the way this bride followed her groom. As such, groom prefers to name this holiday Chag Hamatzos, to highlight and be forever be reminded of his beloved bride's unshakable faithfulness of ready to run out into the wilderness. 
And along comes the bright side and disagrees. We talk about ourselves. We call it Passover. Why? Because in commemoration for the groom's unconditional allegiance. What happened? We all know God passed over. He spared the bride's home during the course of the plague. The plague of the firstborn. So, what do we see over here? We see that each one is complementing the other. We call it the holiday of, we call it Passover. God in the Torah calls it Hagamatzas. This, this, is the, this is what we're, we're, we're em emphasizing. Each one is in love with the other and wants to express the love of what they see the other in. Not about themselves, but how they see the others. We thank Hashem for passing over. God thanks us for having faith, for having the faith, expressed that faith through the matzah. Let's look at the, the, the next, this holiday. That's the holiday of the quarrel over Passover holiday name. Let's look at the holiday of, of, uh, of Shavuos. This same difference of opinion occurs again as we celebrate the sixth day of Sivan. The Torah, the groom, so to speak, calls this holiday Shavuos. What do we call it? What is it? It's called Zman Matan Tarasenu. Shavuos represents, this is the, the holiday of the weeks, the counting of the many weeks coming from Passover. Shavuos is seven weeks since Passover. But we call it, as we say it in our prayers, the time of the giving of the Torah. See again, there's a complement of each other. On the one hand, weeks represents, God says, this is the holiday of the weeks. This is where you were counting each day. You're so excited and you're so filled with faith to move out of Egypt and count every day to come to Mount Sinai. So I recognize how you've used every day of these seven weeks to better yourself and to be ready for the celebration. We, on the other hand, right, even as the groom seeks to underscore our commitment, our counting, the countdown, and therefore calling it Shavuos, recalling the seven-week period of love and devotion embarked on by the affectionate bride coming out of Egypt, incredibly, nowhere in the Torah is even mentioned the word that Shavuos is the time when the Torah was given. That's the way we see it. Because ultimately, we maintain the opposite. The holiday has nothing to do with her, about how, how much she showed her love. It's how much we appreciate what God gave us, giving us the Torah at Mount Sinai. So again, there's a difference of opinion and perspective from between the two. God calls it the holiday of Matzah, we call it Passover. God calls it the holiday of Shavuos, and we call it the time of giving the Torah. Same thing with the Sukkot. It's also uh, it's still a, an ongoing argument, how you, what the holiday of Sukkot is all about. Was it a real hut, or was it clouds? Again, there's a difference of opinion. One way it's called the, the, the clouds, which represent the, these, these very special guardian clouds that protected us as we went through the wilderness. Or the word sukkah can also mean huts, simple, simple huts, tents, or little, little, uh, you know, very uncomfortable place. Again, it's difference of perspective. One sees it, thank you Hashem for the for the amazing clouds of protection. We see it from that perspective. God sees it. Oh, look at that. Even though I took you out of Egypt and put you into little huts, you still continued on. So again, each one seeks to complement each other. And that is what I'm here to share with you today. That the bride sees sukkah as a symbol of the clouds of glory. She sits in the sukkah and recalls how the many miracles and the wonderful things that surrounded them. The groom, on the other hand, says, look at this. They're willing to go into these shabby, decrepit little huts as long, to, as long as they would follow us. Again, each one complementing each other. So it pays well for us to remember, to look at our own marriages with the success of the marriage that we had, the relationship we have with God. 
and how we can apply the same formula in our own relationships with our own beloved husbands and wives, the beautiful offspring of that holy union that happened at Mount Sinai. So I would call this type of disagreement between couples the perfect argument. It's the charming dispute of spouses constantly seeking to set the other above themselves. Because that's how marriage flourishes. You see, I've actually tried arguing with my wife in this manner. And believe, it, believe it or not, it turned out to be fun. What was the best part of it? They were arguments that neither of us minded losing. So I believe that this idea of this reoccurring fight, so to speak, between Hashem and ourselves finds expression in many other areas as well. For example, the holiday of Rosh Hashanah also has difference of, a, you know, one place is called the holiday of the shofar blowing. We call it Rosh Hashanah. The same thing with the mitzvah of, of tefillin. This is what's written in our tefillin, what's written in God's tefillin, because God does the same mitzvahs that he asks us to do. The, the key to all of this is, is for us to appreciate that the key development of any relationship is to seek what's best in others, to complement that which others are providing, so to speak, in the relationship, rather than it being about ourselves, telling it how great I am, it's ourselves telling our spouse how great you are. So this ongoing quarrel, so to speak, can be found in how the Jewish people call the three major holidays, perhaps even Rosh Hashanah as well. But these three holidays, Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, are absolute examples of how a relationship should be, where God compliments us and we compliment Hashem. And also again, as I said in the beginning of the program, the importance to learn from the way God communicated us, the location, the seriousness, and not to overdo it, but get to the point. Look what, look, that communication that was given once and once only at Mount Sinai still reverberates around our whole life, so to speak, wherever we go. And surely during the time like this, during this crazy, you know, COVID-19 period with Hashem's help, we'll come to the conclusion very speedily. I want to take the opportunity to wish everybody continued good health. I know those who need a speedy recovery should have it very, 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 very quickly. And, of course, may Hashem bless us to be able to come together again in a complete way when all of us will be healthy and well and accomplish you so much in our life. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you all the best. Have a wonderful, safe week. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I appreciate your attention. Have a wonderful day. Zai Gizad. Four.